Indeed, that was uh, some 12 hours ago. To help us with that uh, question, where are the missing residents? We are joined by Kofi AJ. He's correspondent with our sister station, Adum TV, for an update on the situation. Kofi, are the residents back? Do we know where they are? No, a majority of them are still not back yet. And as of yesterday, uh, the military officers became the whole entire community, especially the women and the children, from mm. the morning to this morning, uh, around 12 a.m., before they released them to their various houses, mm. those who left. But as I, as I was speaking to you now, they released them to their various homes, but majority of them are still, those who were detained are still, I mean, uh, leaving the community because they don't know when, they will be arrested again, and mm. the MC for Gasat, the Municipal Chief Executive for Gasat, is having a current meeting with the military hierarchy to find a last thing mm. so whether uh, the military officers will, will still be there or they will leave. But uh, as of this morning, uh, if you go to uh, Oboom community, a uh, majority of the military officers have left to Accra, okay. leaving about 50 people, uh, 50 military officers in the town. Mm. Kofi, Tuesday dawn, you reported that some persons were rounded up, persons believed to have taken part in that uh, violence or clash leading to the injuring of the military men. Do we know where those uh, persons are? Uh, uh, those guys have run away. They have run away. Even they left before the arrival of the military officers. So as I'm speaking to you now, we learned that uh, some of them have come to Kaswa and others. Uh, to different locations. So as I'm speaking to you, I don't know where we, we don't know where they are now. Mm. You also spoke to uh, a medical officer who is concerned that the situation is affecting health delivery in the area. Uh, we are also understanding that some of his uh, workers are affected. Yes, uh, because uh, initially uh, Boom was not part of the, the soup, but uh, the military officers, I mean. Uh, came there and arrested everybody. So the operation started around 1 a.m. So they were, they were all asleep. And majority of the workers are not staying in the uh, uh, hospital bungalows. So they stay within the community. So uh, they arrested all of them. But uh, with the help of the uh, assembly, they were able to identify the health workers. But majority of them were traumatized due to the uh, excessive gunshots and mm. the intimidation. And majority of them were, they were tortured and, uh, I mean, assaulted. Because when military officers are in the town and doing so, you can, you can imagine what will happen mm. to them. Finally, Kofi, we are seeing in our shots uh, some uh, pictures or videos of a burnt vehicle and a motorcycle. Do we know who owns that vehicle and who burnt them? Yeah, those property belongs to the uh, of Atim Apeja, uh, Atim Apeja uh, who, who in the person of uh, Nana Tapokuma, uh, Nana Tapokuma, Kuma, who, uh, those property belongs to him. Mm, and, and who set them ablaze? Uh, the, uh, the residents. Residents of Obu, uh, Parsi, and they are they about 30 communities. So they went to the site and said, oh, this property is ablaze. And this is over land dispute, we understand. How long has that um, dispute festered? Do we know? Oh, according to the chief, they have been there for about 200 to 300 years now. But recently, and they had information that uh, in Punwahene of Asima Peja is claiming the ownership of the, that portion of that. It's about, uh, I think, 500, uh, 500 acres of land. Mm. And then Punwahene was saying that that land belongs to them. So they came there, he came there with the military men to get the land. I mean, they wanted to sell the land, so he, he mobilized them with three men and came there. That's the reason why. It's a, but they have been there for over 200 years now, but we don't know the reason why uh, the chief is claiming the ownership of that land. But uh, documents available to the assembly indicate that that portion of the land belongs to the, uh, 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 the, the eastern part of Ghana, which is the Athens. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Kofi J is a reporter with our sister station, Adum TV. Let's now get some analysis on this. Joining us is Adam Bona. He's a security consultant and chief executive of Security Warehouse Limited. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Once again, we are having a situation where citizens are attacking military persons. This has a semblance to what happened uh, with the late Major Maxwell Mahama. Fortunately, this time the soldiers, uh, though seriously injured, didn't die. But 
What do you think, or what signal do you think this sends, especially to the military, about their relationship with the citizens? Oh, yes, good morning to your viewers. Uh, the signal this sends to the military hierarchy, and I believe that uh, the president, who happens to be the commander in chief of the Ghana Armed Forces, is very simple that a lot more work needs to be done uh, to improve upon civilian uh, military relationship. Uh, we, I mean, uh, if, since uh, the days of the coups, citizens, uh, you know, civilian relationship uh, used to be very bad. But I think in most uh, recently, in, in, in recent times, I would say we've seen some amount of improvement. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure whether it is the, uh, the, the, the military probably trying to break the gap between themselves and the civilians or mm -hmm. the rest of our civilians that is culminating into uh, some civilians taking the loss into their own hands and sometimes uh, if you, the case of Major Mama as you raised killing some officers and you know brutalizing these particular two officers and other uh, infractions we've seen against the military I would want to see more uh, collaboration between civilians, CSOs, and the military, and the mm -hmm. civilians at large, so that the civilians will... The military as an institution is there to protect them, and so at no point should the military be as an enemy to civilians or as an enemy to uh, the ordinary person. Mm -hmm. uh, probably this is what might have culminated into uh, these young men, criminals, I will call them criminals, taking the laws into their own hands and not respecting the authority. Mm -hmm. These officers were wearing military uniform. And even if uh, it was a war situation uh, and you captured them, you have captured them. Simple, uh, these were, let's say they were prisoners of war. Uh, the international conventions do not even allow prisoners of war to be brutalized because you could be on the other side one day. And so for them to have captured them, uh, put it that way, and, you know, dehumanizing them, I'm watching your, you know, and stripping them almost, a bloody, bloody face, mm. I think that is despicable. Mm. And uh, I hope that uh, moving on, these things will not be seeing these things uh, mm. as we are seeing now. Mm. Mr. Bonner, does this uh, uh, also in any way affect the morale of soldiers? Um, we know the training they go through, the respect they attach to their uniforms even, and, and the jobs they carry out. I'm looking at m military men watching their colleagues treated this way. Recipe for retaliation? Recipe for disaster? Well, it is, it is I think, uh, all of it. Recipe for retaliation. But if you know the way the military are trained, they are supposed to be gentlemen. You know, they are supposed to be gentlemen. Uh, they have guns. And so uh, I'm sure there's a very good reason why they did not literally shoot into the public. Mm. Uh, because of their training, they could have probably attempted to shoot. And if you know how Major Mama died, unfortunately, he had, he had a sidearm, but there is no indication uh, anybody... He killed anybody before he died. It tells you uh, how rigorous our military officers are trained, you know, to a very large extent. And so, yes, uh, sometimes when these things happen, I would usually would have wished that when it happens, the whole place becomes a crime scene. The military should not usually be deployed into the place, uh, get the police to go in because they are, uh, you know, they have prosecutorial powers. They have what it takes to gather all the evidence, arrest the right people, and ensure that the right people are put before court and punished if the evidence is available. Mm. But when it happens this way, officers go into town, send into the town, and bundle people together. Usually, those who commit these types of crimes are the strongest among the people. They tend to run away first, knowing very well they are, you know, low in committing that particular uh, act of criminality or mm. barbarity. And so as far as I am concerned, I would have wished that it would have been moving in there, making sure uh, the police takes over, arrest who needs to be arrested. If the police cannot handle it, then you are going to have a joint military 
uh, police or police military operations where, uh, you know, they do this together. But where you have the military, you know, uh, swarming the town, going into the town and literally putting the town into a lockdown mode. For me, it is something that sometimes further deepens the relationship between the military and civilians. And so uh, I have spoken to office first, and they feel mm. pained. Some of them feel mm. Mm. that uh, this is not what they expect from the people they are supposed to be protecting. Mm. But these things didn't start today. Police, sorry, military officers performing civilian duties have been with us probably uh, after 19, you know, 57, where military officers are deployed. But our own laws do not allow, do not permit these things for military mm. officers to be deployed into civilian areas without a reason. Okay. And so I would hope that in whilst we have these conversations moving on, uh, gradually, I know the current uh, defense ministry seems to be, uh, you know, redrawing uh, officers from civilian populated areas, if you know Operation Vanguard. Uh, they've redrawn almost uh, all the military officers. It was public. It was put in the public. So these are some of the things some of us want to see. So that the military officers are returned to the barracks to be performing military duties only. Okay. Mr. Bona, but the, the military were said to be engaging in land guardism. We understand that they were protecting uh, a parcel of land that uh, had some dispute over ownership. Is that the normal mission of the military? Are they uh, allowed to be involved in such activities? Not at all, under no circumstances. If it's a military land, if it is a military land, you expect the military to protect their turf. But if it is a civilian, you know, uh, land, I mean, i.e. some chiefs or communities fighting over a land, or if by executive instrument, the President of the Republic decides to take that dumb fiasi area, the whole community, and says everybody should move. And they are proving to a constituent they don't want to move. The President of the Republic, through an executive instrument, could say, uh, could declare a state of emergency around the area and send the military in to push everybody out. Mm. And that is backed by law. But in this uh, type of operations, and one of the military officers who was brutalized, I mean, uh, spoke to the media. And we know that uh, those of us who are in this space knows this is not what military officers are uh, trained to do. He, I think he spoke too much by giving, giving out information about his deal. I mean, the commanding officer. Some commanding officers are reckless. I mean, let me put it, you know, that way, are reckless. As a commanding officer, you have a, a small number, a large number of, you know, officers, other ranks under you, and you, you use them for, I mean, who come under you for operations. And so sometimes at the blind side of the CDS and probably government or the Ministry of Defense, some of these uh, commanding officers deploy some of these people who, work, mm. who comes under them to perform some of these functions. And so mine is that I would want to believe that proper investigations will be put in place so that at the end of the day, whoever this commanding officer's name is, would be brought to book because as far as I'm concerned, this doesn't look like a sanctioned military operations because, I mean, military officers are not supposed to be protecting land, mm. especially that don't belong to them. Okay. But the president has not said, uh, you know, they, by executive instrument, he wants to take over. Mm. And so these issues need to be investigated. Okay. Uh, fi finally, Mr. Bonner, so what can be done to deal uh, with the, the possibility of this you know, um, affecting the morale of the soldiers. You just mentioned that the officer shouldn't have spoken so much. Probably he did out of fear for his life, uh, considering what happened to his colleagues some three years ago. So what should we be doing? We've spoken about uh, dealing with the civilian military relationship, but within the ranks of the military itself, I'm sure this must be very disappointing to them. How do we make sure it doesn't affect morale and uh, the, the professionalism of soldiers? Well, I believe the CDS, uh, one of the, I mean, probably the longest serving military officer currently, he knows what to do. He needs to gather his men. I mean, they are trained to deal with these type of situations. And so uh, I do believe that if any, uh, any military officer who is well trained will see this to be one of 
the situations that they've been trained to deal with that sometimes the people you are trained, the people you are there to protect could turn against you. I mean, we saw that in Iraq, where Iraqis turned against the Americans and saw the Americans as, uh, you know, the enemy. And so as far as I'm concerned, a lot of conversation must go on, a lot, a lot of, you know, reorientation of our military officers within the barracks and letting them know that, you see, they are there to protect us, but sometimes there could be excesses. And so as far as I'm concerned, I want to believe that going into 2020, uh, we, we need a joint military task force to deal with, you know, uh, excesses when, with regards to the election. So I want to see the military going in and probably the military uh, aiding the police and the other security agencies, uh, not having a, a certain mentality that if the civilians misbehave, they are going to deal with them. Because at the end of the day, you cannot be a military officer if you are not a Ghanaian. If you are not a full-blooded Ghanaian, you can't be a military officer. And so mine is that this issue should be dealt with diligently because when into 2020, if we leave this thing and believe that it's going to just die off, we'll go into 2020 and just a little thing, you see a military officer probably brutalizing a civilian, which might be, we could still, we could do a lot of damage to what we are expecting to see uh, during the elections. Mm. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Adam Bonner is CEO of uh, Security Warehouse Limited, and he's been sharing his thoughts uh, about that incident which occurred some 72 hours ago. Now, 92 shops belonging to foreign traders at the Swami Magazine have been locked as a trade ministry committee on foreign retail trade clamped down on violators of trade laws in Kumasi. 51 shops closed uh, uh, Mon uh, Wednesday, I beg your pardon, after 41 shops were closed at the start of the exercise Tuesday. The focus has been on foreign traders who are not complying with provisions of the GIPC Act at the Swami Magazine Artisanal Hub. The committee says it gave effect to traders 18 months to comply with the directives of the investment agreement. Prince Apia has more in this report. This is my task clearance. This is also GIPC. The Ghana Foreigners Retail Trade Impasse has lingered for many years. On Monday, the Committee of Foreigners in Retail Trade under the Trade Ministry visited shops without proper documentation of GIPC and locked them. Spare parts dealer Stephen Oswala is one of them. All the documents was right, but still they, they asked me to get out of the shop. They want to lock the shop, so I don't know the reason. Inscriptions pasted on locked up shops warns anyone that tempers with the lock will attract extra sanctions. Nana Kwabnapepra is a member of the committee. The team has been here for almost 18 months and then we, we did the assessment, check their documents and other things. So we have given them almost 18 months to regularize, to do the right thing and then they have not done it. The committee says the shops will be open when traders regularize their operations with respect to the proper documentations. You've seen so many institutions doing trading in Ghana, like Melcoms, the Matmats, and then they are all doing retail trading, but they are all complying with our investments laws. We are not saying they shouldn't do, but they should do the right thing, what the law says. If the law says do da 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 and do the trading, do da 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 and do the trading. So the notices that we place on the shops, it shows them where to go and then regularize those documents and then do their, their trading. Meanwhile, the Nigerian Union of Traders Association says they are being treated unfairly. Kizito Obiora is the chairman. They started the operation yesterday. So now they have locked for one shop so far. Majority of those shops they locked have registered with Register General. Register with internal uh, Ghana Revenue Authority, have their resident permit, and pay all the necessary uh, taxes. But say their shop were locked. Mr. Biora is therefore calling on the Nigerian government to evacuate them if possible. Since last year, November till now, to to renew our resident permit is a very difficult, and I don't know the reason. Mainly for Nigerians, whenever you send your passport. To immigration, they will say, Oh, Nigerian passport. Hmm. They will not do anything. The passport will be lying there. They will not tell you. After paying everything, they won't give it to you. 
I don't know whether it's deliberately, they're deliberately doing that just to harm us this time around. And that's the reason why the majority of our people now will not be able to renew their, their permit. But still, those who have renewed their permit, their shop were locked to show you that this issue of register or no register is not the problem. If truly what happened yesterday is what government asked them to do, which means we are not saving Ghana. We are just pleading to our government. Let our government come for our aid. Possible to evacuate us, let us go back to Nigeria. The committee will continue the inspection process till Friday. Prince Apia reporting. We've been joined by Prince. Uh, Prince, uh, just tell us if the uh, operation is still underway. Yes, Ben, is, um, the operation is expected to continue um, today till Friday. Mm. That's tomorrow. Mm. So um, the committee. Um, they decide what time particularly they, they move out. So today, definitely, they will continue. Mm, and uh, we, we're just hearing from the Niger Nigerian traders. They are upset. They say that their uh, residence permits are not even being renewed. Do we have a response on that particular uh, concern? Uh, that we, we don't have a response or uh, response okay. on that. I think mm. we have to reach the immigration service to understand what is happening. That and uh, we've reported on the shops that were closed, but are there any of them who had the right documentation? Yes, yeah, that is difficult to um, ascertain because the committee um, have insisted almost all the time that mm. what they are looking out for is the right documentation. If you don't have it, they cannot um, allow you to operate. Um, these um, traders some of them claim they have the proper documentation. But, of course, from um, a journalist's point of view, it would be very difficult for me to um, tell whether this one is an authentic document or mm. not. But the committee that is, you know, um, ha ha has that mandate to do that, saying that these persons are not, uh, uh, do not have the right documentation. But I should say that uh, right from the report, you understand that uh, immediately they close the shop, they paste the notice uh, in front of the shop, and they look really carefully and, and it's straightforward that if you are able to, to buy the right documentation and regularize your, your, your operations, then straight to the Ministry of um, Trade and Industry, they will come and open your shop for you. So mm. that, is, that is what is happening. Yeah. Is it the case that we have... Uh, all the foreign-owned shops in this area being Nigerian? Um, that, that is not, um, that cannot be entirely accurate mm. because um, um, there are not only Nigerians, there are other nationals as well. That is um, the information I picked up yesterday. But there are other nationals as well. But it, the, the issue is that a majority, a good number of the um, foreign traders who mm. are there are Nigerian traders engaged in the uh, retail business. That is why um, almost all the time it is the Nigerian Traders Association that comes out to talk about these things. Uh, Prince Apia is a man in the Ashanti region bringing us a report on what transpired at Swami Magazine uh, uh, in the early parts of this week. We understand that that uh, program will still continue. Away from Swami Magazine, She's known by many for venturing into a profession with few women, sports photography and photojournalism. She's trended in the past times uh, for the way in which she carries her really long lenses with other gadgets strapped to her body and the passion with which she works. This time around, it's for going to work with her baby strapped to her back. Senior John uh, Ousi Adadabo is my guest this morning. And we'll be talking about the photo that's trending and uh, its impact on young girls who want to be like her. Grateful that you could join the show this morning. Now, I'm not sure you did this to trend, obviously, but since that photo was taken, uh, it's been shared on social media and in many quarters. How does that make you feel? Uh, well, sorry, uh, sorry, Senior Dom, your your microphone is muted. It is. Okay. Well, great, yes. So how can does that make now? you feel? Yes, we can. 
Okay, are you ready for my answer? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I am. For the first time, mm. um, I'm jealous because I've gone to an event to cover an event and it's not my work that is trending. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a typical um, mm. photographer's thing for mm. you. Mm. I mean, I, I would appreciate 10 likes of my work to a thousand likes of a personal photo of mine. Mm, mm. So I congratulate my, my colleague who took the photo. <laughs> she got a new side in it. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, mm. I mean, I've had um, a, a few, like, I mean, with, with all these things, you should expect um, um, some, you know, negatives and yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I saw a few saying that, um, you know, Caillou's carry their children. But the, the interesting thing is that I don't have a role model. My inspirations are the Caillou's or the Caillou's that are, you know, um, that are in the markets. Because I always believe that if they can do it, if they mm. can carry their children, how much more me? Mm. So, in fact, I was six months pregnant when I covered the World Cup. My inspiration were the Caillou's because they are pregnant and they carry loads. Mm. So I didn't see how I wouldn't be pregnant and that will stop me from covering a World Cup. Mm. So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, Okay. So a lot of, uh, I also saw some comments where a lot of people were inspired. They actually um, tagged young yes, girls I they know. That. Mm. Yes. They yes, tagged young that. girls they know uh, because they're trying to point them to a good role model in, in their estimation. And uh, mm. you've just mentioned that you were pregnant while you covered the World Cup. It reminds me of Serena Williams. Uh, playing while she was pregnant as well. But where do you get your strength from? A apart from the Kaya years you've spoken about, where do you get your strength from? What keeps you going? Yeah. Well, I mentioned one, you mentioned the other. So, um, oh, this is the internet. Is, can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So I mentioned one of my inspirations that so you just mentioned the other. Um, so one of the issues that came for me that year when I was pregnant and then the World Cup was one of the things that I had targeted to do that year. And so I asked myself, what, what should stop me from working? If those that I should do it whilst pregnant, why should me being pregnant stop me from working? Mm. So, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, Serena is one of my inspirations as well. So, I, I, you know, I believe that if, if you're doing something that you like and you have a focus on, you just don't see the barriers you it's a sight you for me i think i even love my daughter more because she didn't stop me from doing my um greatest work for 2018 that was i wanted to cover the russian world cup and she in fact gave me the inspiration even though i caused a lot of troubles in russia where they got to know you're pregnant they said oh okay we'll tolerate your nonsense for today <laughs> so yeah um, you know it's it's um it's, it's just you. It's, mm. it's what you want to do and what you set out, the results you set out. So, yes, I've also seen a thousands of um, positive remarks, and I didn't know that many people knew of my works. Mm. And so I'm most humbled and uh, I'm most grateful for the encouragement that mm. I've gotten. Mm. You're known widely for your, your job as a sports uh, photographer, and that's a field you don't find a lot of women in at all. And so for the young women who've been asked to look up to you, uh, just permit me to allow you to do some free consultation this morning. What would you tell them? What must yeah. they do uh, to, to be that unique person, venture into a field where a lot of women are not seen? How do they achieve that? Okay. I, would, I wouldn't be gender biased. So okay. I'll speak to both young women and young men. Perfect. Um, it's... Um, you, we pray that we are all lucky to identify what we can do and what would come as a second nature apart from driven to us. Mm. And when you find that, you, you really flow um, and you give it your all. And you, you, you have to have a target. You see, when you have a target that, let's say, by 6 o'clock, I should have attained so and so things, it makes it easier for you in life. And so they should, I pray for them, not only in photography, but in every aspect you want to be, uh, especially in the skill or rented um, professions. Um, of course, any profession is skill or rented, but you know what I mean. Um, you know, the creatives. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, but you have to persevere. Um, it, you know, things don't come immediately, but the perseverance 
that it, you don't you shouldn't follow any flow because somebody you admire is doing it that is a non-starter don't follow any field because anybody you admire is do it anything you do has to come from within your spirit and then it's natural for you yes love when you have any obstacle it still goes easy for you mm. am i still on yes you are in my yeah so so yeah so it shouldn't is to both young men and young women do not do things because somebody you admire is into that profession mm. do something that comes to you naturally what you really want to do um we i pray that everybody will be able to fight for what they want to do and to make sense of out of it and let people see that they are justified in choosing what they want to do because when you are in such a field no matter the difficulty no matter the obstacles you find a way around it it's like a second nature to you mm. nothing seems impossible i tell you i find you know putting my daughter together in the morning when i do that that's my greatest um heckle or is it head out <laughs> across for the day mm -hmm. anything else is easy for me as soon as i'm able to have hair and all that mm. then it's easy for me and i'm at a photo yesterday people keep asking was that was that not was there nobody at home and all there are lots of people but my daughter is super active so i think i would rather have a great uh, you know a serene mind shooting knowing that she's she's very secured at my back exactly i'm going back home and then i mean your auntie tells you oh i'm sorry you know yo yo jumped and fell and i know she jumps i know she climbs mm. so sometimes for me the safest place is at my back mm. so yes I, I do have people to help me but sometimes you also have to not set the people around you up for failure mm. so i'm sorry if it wasn't that picture wasn't too pleasant to some people but it was a necessity I mean, I didn't. I can't give my daughter as an excuse for not working anymore because we need money to survive. <laughs> <laughs> we need money to survive, right? Yes, and we then, do. Um, and then you should, when children or anything that also stops you from your profession, you will start hating that thing. Mm. That is something that people should. Anything that stops, especially women, anything that stops us from our profession. Mm. We tend to hate the thing. So I think I have a best bond with my daughter because, you know, like I, when I was shooting the serial, um, she slept throughout the match with all this chanting and this um, European football hooligans. She was so <laughs> sleepy. She said, well, her first half was over. She woke up, took mm. her milk, and went back. Went back. <laughs> you see, even with this, you can see that she was sleeping. Mm. So she does mm. help me as mm. if she has a timer. You know, as soon as the event is over, she just wakes up graciously. Mm, mm. So yes, yeah, so let's let's. I pray for everybody to find what your what you want to do. Do not ever follow somebody because you admire the person. Mm. Admiring the person doesn't copy their life. No, mm, sure. you also have your own unique mm. life. So the fact that I admire Benny's doesn't mean you have to be a news broadcaster. No, you admire her consistency, her passion, her dedication. So that is what you should, you should admire the qualities of a person. All right. You not, you know, what the person, person I don't does have to put necessarily. Oh, it's it's so great to have you here, Senior John. Uh, we'd have to end it for now. Please send our love to the little girl. And uh, we wish you all the best. Hopefully, uh, we can get our sports Thank back on track you. and Thank see you uh, working you. actively. All the best. Now, the Ghana Stock Exchange has returned a negative 20.61% in dollar term for investors since January this year. This ranks it 10th among 15 top stock exchanges on the African continent, but better than the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Charles Nixon Yabwa has more in this report. Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index, which measures the total value of all stocks on the best, has however recorded a negative 18.51% return in CD terms so far this year. The negative performance has consequently affected the total market capitalization. Investors have therefore lost about 4 billion cities as the market capitalization has fallen to about 52.7 billion cities. So far, only 4 out of 38 listed companies on both the main and the SME market have appreciated in value. They are Aluex, Camelot, Das Pharma and SIC.
Interestingly, all the banking stocks have lost value in their shares, with the hardest hit being Car Bank. Nevertheless, trading activities have been quite impressive. Over 1 million worth of shares valued at more than 621 million cities. However, exchange hands yesterday when President Ekufuadu paid a courtesy call on managers of the exchange. And that's your business update. Sports is up next. Time now to talk sports with George Addo mm -hmm. Jr. And let's make reference to that photo there, yeah. Black Lives Matter. We know this has been uh, trending for some time, but this year, especially after the death of George Floyd, many celebrities have joined the campaign uh, to end police brutality against yes. black people. Yeah. Uh, but there I can see some basketball players. And uh, to tell you that the NBA playoff games mm -hmm. expected this dawn didn't come off because... Um, the players decided not to play. Wow! Yeah, boycotting. So we had That's no the latest NBA, team, right? Yeah, yeah. So we had no NBA playoff games. And I see that was not enough. Uh, the women's NBA as mm. well decided mm. not to play mm. any game. Mm. And then it even went into tennis because Naomi Osaka has qualified to the semi finals of the Southern and Western mm. Open. Mm. And she decided not to play the semi final as well. Can we try to put is, this in context? Yes, just yeah. before. Just before I do that. It's very dangerous because the U.S. Open is starting on the 31st of August in the United States. Mm. If they cannot get the players to come back to play, we won't have the first Grand Slam. I mean, the second Grand Slam of the year. It won't happen. Wow. Yeah. Now, all of these are happening just following up what happened in Wisconsin mm -hmm. with um, the shooting of um, Jacob Blake. Yes. And the players are saying if they go ahead with these games, people will watch. And it's like the games they are playing will be a deflection of the real issue. They want to step out of the ring and allow the focus, focus. and the tension to rise as much for authorities to begin to, to do act and do something about it. This, these are what the players are saying. And it's very interesting because it's ongoing. And already, this is a, this is a protracted season. It's so extended. Mm. They've all had to you know, get themselves in Disney World in a bubble to try and complete a season. And this Happens. is definitely going to make it difficult mm. for the season mm. to be... Um, completed. And even what's worse is that it could affect the U.S. Open. U.S. Open have gone through so much just to come to a place where some players are hoping to, to, to play in the competition. Mm. And because we've had, like, I think about six or top ten guns say that we won't play because of coronavirus. And this is a different virus of a kind that can affect the U.S. Open. And if you're not careful, it may not come on because it's supposed to be coming on on the 31st of August, and you mm. know, just a few days. Mm. They're talking uh, next week, Monday. Mm. Uh, so for those who've not been following the story, uh, the, the players and athletes have been protesting, been joining yes, they have been, yes. over the months, yes. but I think this time they want to take it a notch higher yes. uh, because it, it appears that their, their concerns aren't being addressed. And, yes, because they say that the George Floyd case was one, but he's still resting perfect peace, and then this is just too much. They now have to do more. Mm. The likes of Naomi Osaka and a lot of the, the NBA players were on Twitter, were, were tweeting, Black Lives Matter, that, 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 they're saying that, look, it's enough. Mm. Now let's prove to them that it's that serious. So okay. they're not playing. Wow. They're boycotting games. Mm. And, and on, this, on. this could affect uh, not only uh, entertainment yes. as it is with, with sports, mm. but also uh, the economy of it. Yeah, it, it is. It is going to because all the competitions in the USA are going to be under threat. So we talk baseball, we talk American football, we talk soccer, soccer. MLS. We could, we'll see that happening in MLS, and they're going to be um, discussions in the subsequent bulletins. And when we get to speak mm. to Drake, Drake will mm. give us an idea that even the MLS are planning not to play. So it means that sports will be totally shut down in the mm. U.S., and that's not what they want because everybody's trying to finish things up. All right, let's Whilst, talk about yeah, Messi. Mm, that's shutting uh, down in the U.S. Yeah, um, the, m m the, there's a lot of speculation about mm. where Messi's heading next. Do we have any hints? I've seen some uh, Kumasiya Sante Kotoko. Oh, <laughs> I know. I saw that uh, and I said, <laughs> and just to be fair, does it's, any it's, team it's in Ghana show. have them? I, I don't think any team in Ghana would even dream, would of, even it. dream of it. This is because mm. I think we are looking for a $500 million loan as a country. And the buyout clause for Messi is 700 million euros. So hello? Nobody gets a chance to do that. On but, that but note, no, just, just as a reminder, anyway. I, I won't permit but, but, but you to even, drop any more even, bombs. Even on, the, even on the large scale, there are just a few clubs who can do this. Man City, Paris Saint-Germain, Manchester United. These three clubs even need Messi and Barcelona to step down 
on the buyout clause. It's too difficult and not to cut. George, thank you but very much. But we wish Kotoko and Hasbrook the best of luck. In Please. Jalais, you can all try. George, Give it a try. thank you so much yes, for sir. joining this edition of News. Asamaja is on sale, though. It's free. At 